Obviously, there have been some pretty big losers at the running back position lately. You got guys like Antonio Gibson, Miles Sanders. I mean, even an Aaron Jones sliding in rankings. And on the opposite end of the spectrum, you have some running backs that are getting positive buzz. Maybe that's an A.J. Dillon potentially being the running back one in Green Bay. Maybe that's Damian Pierce looking more and more likely to just be the first rookie running back with a full-time starting job. I, I don't know. We're going to dive into our top 30 rankings here. Before we get into it, make sure... If you're not subscribed, you fix your life. Go down there, subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell next to the subscribe button if you want to get notified whenever we go live. We live stream Real Money Fantasy Drafts every single night. And if we hit 90,000 subscribers before the season starts, we will get a 24-hour live stream draft marathon underway. Hell, of course, you know, if you're already subscribed, you'll go down there, drop that like on the video to make it more likely that we are recommended to someone who isn't subscribed and as always, I appreciate the support so damn much. I'm going to respond to the first 200 comments, at least the first 200 comments on this video. So if you have any questions, feel free to throw them down below. Let's dive right into this. Tier one, we have Jonathan Taylor at one. The highest floor ceiling combination you're going to find at the running back position. I know a lot of people think that this team's going to be more pass happy with Matt Ryan coming over. I know people think that the coaching reports are true, that they're going to try to split Jonathan Taylor and Naheem Hines more than they did last no, this team's strength is Jonathan Taylor. Jonathan Taylor is this team. This team's going to be funneled through him. They're going to look to run the ball over and over and over again, just like they did last year. I don't see why they would change that up one bit. I mean, just go back to Wisconsin and look what they did with that Jonathan Taylor in Wisconsin. He's missed one game in the past five years, and that was due to a COVID close contact. He has to be the 101 in all formats that aren't super flex. Now, going over to two, we are going to have Christian McCaffrey with CMC. Probably does have a higher ceiling than Jonathan Taylor in a PPR format, just given the fact that he can get up to almost a 25% team target share. I think most people in fantasy football overrate their ability to predict injuries. So I'm going to be completely fine going through and ranking Christian McCaffrey in this top tier. And a running back that we previously had in tier two, that I think for a full PPR format, we do need to move him up to tier one is going to be Austin Eckler. Now, the reason I'm moving him up is one of the small concerns you had with Eckler is now no longer really worrying at all in Los Angeles. I mean, you had Isaiah Spiller, in my opinion, with the chance to be the best running back that Austin Eckler's played alongside since Melvin Gordon. But reports out of training camp making it sound like Isaiah Spiller wasn't even going to be the running back two here to begin with, plus Isaiah Spiller dealing with the injury. So I think you have a very similar workload for Austin Eckler that he had last season. I still think the touchdowns come down 100%. But in a full PPR format, I think you can move into tier one. It's difficult. It's almost as if he should be in his own tier because I think at this point, you can't take any of the tier two running backs over Eckler. But I'd still have such a hard time drafting either Jonathan Taylor or CMC over him. But now let's go down to tier two here, leading off with our guy, Joe Mixon. We've said this all offseason. Every single one of these running backs in tier two, they have their own red flags and they all have elite level ceilings as well. With Joe Mixon, finally has a top 10 offensive line. Joe Mixon had arguably one of the worst offensive lines in the NFL last year. One of the worst offensive lines in the NFL before that, as well as in 2019, when also the team was so bad, they got the number one pick overall to take Joe. This has been a very bad Cincinnati Bengals team for a very long time. It should finally be the complete package. The elite quarterback, the wide receivers to make sure they can't stack the box in the, I don't want to say elite offensive line, but a very good offensive line that PFF has graded out as a top 10 unit. And he's also younger than these running backs outside of Najee Harris in this tier. Now going over to that next running back, Najee Harris, he himself has some serious concerns, like the offensive line not looking great in Pittsburgh. At the same time, this isn't a top level athlete like you're looking at with all the other running backs at the very top. I mean, I think we need to be concerned about the big play potential if we go back to what we saw at Alabama as well. In Pittsburgh, like Najee Harris doesn't have the top in speed to be able to go out there and have those 80 yard rushing touchdowns. But with that being said, he has an extremely high floor with his involvement as a pass catcher, as well as the fact that there's nobody else in RP, nobody else in Pittsburgh to take touches away from him. And he's going into year two. I'll be fine having him at five. Number six, Derrick Henry with Derrick Henry. I understand in casual formats, people are going to have Derrick Henry higher than this. I get it. The man was the running back one on a points per game basis last year, but 
almost the exact opposite as Joe Mixon. Derrick Henry went from a situation where he's used to playing with above average offensive lines over the past three seasons. And now he's going to be dealing with that bottom five-ish offensive line, according to PFF this upcoming season. If we also look at the splits with and without A.J. Brown for Ryan Tannehill in this offense, I am very concerned with the departure of A.J. Brown and how that may impact the ability for the Tennessee Titans to just pick up first downs to be able to extend drives. Not to mention that Derrick Henry is 28 years old. The only other running back at all that's being drafted 28 years old or older in fantasy is what Cordell Patterson is that the only guy inside the top 100 picks outside of Derrick Henry I think so and now our last running back in this tier Dalvin Cook with Dalvin Cook yeah the coaching staff change where I don't think they're going to look to be as run heavy as they've been in the past on top of it with Dalvin Cook he has missed a considerable amount of time every single season with nagging injuries I love me some Alexander Madison behind him. I really just do think that it's going to be a pass first offense for the first time we've pretty much ever seen in Minnesota with Dalvin Cook there. But like I said, in tier two, your personal preference. You go with whoever you want. Like, honestly, if you watch me on a live stream, nine times out of 10, if I'm on the clock at like the 110 on underdog fantasy and Derrick Henry sitting there, Dalvin Cook sitting there, I take Derrick Henry or Dalvin Cook because I know in a lot of those other drafts, I'm going to get Joe Mixon or Najee Harris falling to the second round on underdog. So sometimes I don't even follow these own rankings, but I think the tiers are incredibly important. And of course, if you want to go draft on underdog fantasy with us on the live stream where we draft every single night, maybe you want to get in a draft with your friends. Maybe you want to get in a draft in the public lobby. Make sure you go sign up for Underdog Fantasy. You can find the link down below. And when you sign up for Underdog Fantasy and use promo code FLOCK, they're going to match your first deposit dollar for dollar up to 100. And with a $10 deposit, because I worked my ass off to get you all this deal, with a $10 deposit, you're going to get our 2022 Fantasy Football Draft Guide. 300 pages information. It's going to really help you this season, regardless of if you've already drafted or not. You're going to get our rankings as well. I mean, that will be sent to your email about an hour or two after you sign up with promo code Flock on Underdog. So make sure you take advantage of that. Let's go down to tier three. We also have an update here where we're moving up DeAndre Swift to eight in a full PPR format. I was holding out on this. I had Aaron Jones here. I had DeAndre Swift, Aaron Jones back to back all offseason, but I was preferring Aaron Jones for the touchdown upside we would have in Green Bay compared to Detroit. I just thought that there were going to be significantly more trips to the red zone for the Green Bay Packers. And if we were looking at the Detroit Lions, this is a team that, yes, should be much improved from where they stood last year. But at the same time, they were a bottom five team in the NFL last year. Even if they're much improved, they're still going to be below average compared to the amount of red zone opportunities in Green Bay. It's going to be a wide gap regardless. But with this coaching staff coming out saying, this is a running back one, a running back one, a situation between Aaron Jones and, and AJ Dillon. I do think that we have to be slightly more concerned about AJ Dillon with a red zone role in particular. So maybe the touchdown upside won't even really be worth it in drafting Aaron Jones over DeAndre Swift if AJ Dillon has that red zone role. So let's put Swift at eight. We're going to have Saquon Barkley at 10. With Barkley, I know a lot of people think that they can predict injuries. You can't. I'm telling you that right now. You cannot predict injuries. I mean, if we were looking at him, I think that he is a running back that can get to a 20% team target share, which really nobody else can. Now, I am still concerned with this New York Giants offense. And then at 11, we are going to have Alvin Kamara. I know a lot of people want to move up Alvin Kamara to the Joe Mixon, Dalvin Cook tier. The issue is there's still an outside chance that we see a suspension. Like in all reality, it looks less and less likely. This is why, I mean, back a couple months ago, if y'all are watching the live stream, we were getting fourth round Alvin Kamara when everybody was so worried. But at this point, I think that we just look at him and say, yeah, probably not suspended. It is still in the range of outcomes, especially if it were to happen later in the season now. I think that you probably need to be concerned about that playoff stretch. So I'm not going to be willing to just move up Alvin Kamara to six, seven, and act like the suspension is a 0% probability. We'll have them in tier three. I think you can draft them in the middle of the second round. But we also have to remember, hell, this is a team that has a healthy Michael Thomas, adds in Chris Olave, adds in Jarvis Landry, the target share may not be what it once was for Alvin Kamara. Now let's go down to our fourth tier here. Let's lead it off with Nick Chubb at 12. Long history of Nick Chubb. Hated him in the first round last year, but now you get him in the third round on underdog fans. I'm drafting Nick Chubb everywhere I can. I think this is going to be a 
Very run-heavy offense for the Cleveland Browns through the first 11 weeks of the season. When Deshaun Watson comes back in, maybe all of a sudden this team skews to be a little bit more pass-happy given the efficiency they should see with Deshaun Watson. But honestly, I would just rather have Watson here because this may be an offense that goes from a train wreck, a dumpster fire with Jacoby Brissett, and all of a sudden they had the elite level quarterback play with Watson through the fantasy football playoffs where I think you could see so much touchdown upside for Nick Chubb. Let's move over to our next guy, Leonard Fournette at 13. With Fournette, I am slightly concerned with what we have with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers offensive line. This offensive line looks way different than it did last year. And Leonard Fournette was a lot better than this ranking last year. Leonard Fournette was like the running back six on a poor game basis. I'm also somewhat concerned that they add in Rashad White, who in my opinion was the best pass catching running back in this year's NFL draft coming out of Arizona State. I think that he actually does have a small role on a week to week basis playing alongside Leonard Fournette. But with the offensive line concerns, with the additional running back added in, with the fact that he was drafted way back in 2017, I think it's fair to rank Leonard Fournette below where he finished last year, just with these concerns. But I do easily see the elite level ceiling for him. And then Javante Williams, 14. With Javante, I mean, what? We had him on a buy low running back video every single week last year. He kept on saying, this is it. This is the week they stop using Melvin Gordon. This is the week they decide to give the ball to the better running back in Javante Williams. They continued to use Melvin Gordon as the 50-50 running back. It was actually like Melvin Gordon, 55-45 Javante Williams. This year, I think that Javante definitely leads this backfield. Obviously, there's the contingency upside as well. If Melvin Gordon were to go down and Javante Williams were to just see that workload that he did in the one week Melvin Gordon missed last year in a Russell Wilson led offense, there'd be a crap ton of upside. And moving down to our next year, we're going to have James Conner and Travis Etienne side by side. With James Conner, serious touchdown regression incoming. Like, I think Conner's season is going to look completely different than it did last year. I wouldn't be surprised if James Conner scores literally just half the touchdowns than what we saw last season. But at the same time, you may actually get the targets doubled in this offense with no Chase Edmonds. So if we're expecting the increased receiving down roll, I think that may offset the regression to the mean that we see with his touchdown rate. Because remember, if you go back two years ago, Kyler Murray's a quarterback that can get to 10 rushing touchdowns in a season. I know we didn't see it last year, but I think that Connor cannot score as many touchdowns again, but maybe the departure of Chase Edmonds offsets. It's all be fine having him as that high end running back two here. And now going to our next running back, we have Travis Etienne, 16. I used to say, you know what? Don't give me DeAndre Swift in the second round. Just give me Travis Etienne in the fourth. Easy game, easy money. Well, that was before it looks like James Robinson is actually going to be healthy this season. I am somewhat concerned with Etienne here. Very similar to what we were discussing with Aaron Jones, where we know A.J. Dillon's going to have a role in this offense. We know James Robinson's going to have a role in this offense. The question is, not how many carries they get between the 20-yard lines. You can have all the carries between the 20-yard lines. I don't give a damn. That doesn't translate to fantasy points. But please do not affect the red zone roll. Please give the touches inside the 10-yard line to Aaron Jones, to Travis Etienne. I think we have to lower the floor of Travis Etienne, now understanding that it is in the range of outcomes that James Robinson is the goal line running back here, where that would severely cap the ceiling of Etienne as well. Now, going to our next running back, we called him a league-winning player a while ago, and he had an ADP in the sixth round when we called him that league-winning player, saying that he would finish off the offseason with an ADP in the fourth. It's trending that way. J.K. Dobbins. I mean, with J.K. Dobbins here, getting the report that Gus Edwards is starting on the PUP, I understand that, yeah, they can still go through and split the backfield with Mike Davis, but this should be one of the most run-heavy offenses in the NFL. If we look at how good of a prospect that J.K. Dobbins was coming out of high school. He had the pedigree as a four-star prospect. I mean, then he dominates at Ohio State. Then coming into the NFL, hell, he checks every single box. He's an elite-level athlete. He had a massive workload in college. He gets the NFL draft capital of being the second-round pick for the Baltimore Ravens. Then his rookie season, he leads the NFL in yards per carry at the running back position. Now, I understand, yes, that's mainly because he's running behind an elite offensive line. And he has the Lamar Jackson effect where we know linebackers, they have to freeze whenever Lamar Jackson goes to hand the ball off because Lamar can't take it on the edge. But I got some pretty important news for you. Jake Dobbins still has Lamar Jackson. Jake Dobbins still has a pretty good offensive line. The situation's to be the same that it was his rookie year that allowed him to go out there and lead the NFL in yards per carry. 
The difference is he should have a significantly higher percentage of this team's overall backfield touches. Love J.K. Dobbins, drafting Dobbins everywhere I can now. And then at 18, we are going to have Cam Akers. I understand with Akers, another running back that was out for the season last year, another running back that people do want to go through and fade where they can. I'm going to be buying the dip. Yes, he looked very bad coming after the torn Achilles. Yes, if we look at all running backs through NFL history, a torn Achilles is something that is almost impossible to overcome. But at the same time, you're looking at a player that was a first round pick in fantasy football drafts last year. Let me repeat myself. Cam Akers was a first round selection in fantasy football drafts last season. You are getting that discount on him now when you're able to draft him in the fourth or fifth round. Now, our next running back is Ezekiel Elliott, 19. With Zeke, there are some serious red flags. I understand everybody wants to go down to the comment section and tell me, Mason, he tore his PCL last year. Mason, I mean, you can't hold that against him. He played through an injury. I get it. I, I read the same reports that you did. But at the same time, I'm willing to take a step back, look at the overall scale of the Ezekiel Elliott career, who right now is the second leading active running back in career touches only behind Mark Ingram. If we include playoff touches for Ezekiel Elliott, he's had over 2,000 of them in his NFL career. I think that's probably a guy we need to be concerned about the fall off coming soon. And we've seen this fall off. It wasn't just last season. Going through and looking at Ezekiel Elliott since his rookie season, just consistent every single season decline with his rushing yards per game. Somewhat concerned, running back 17 on a per game basis last year, even though I know a lot of people are going to try to use totals and throw them in my face. 17. He was the running back 17 on a per game basis last year, and he's only a year older. Now we have a Brees Hall at 20 here. With Brees Hall, I know a lot of people are going to be concerned about the preseason game he had where Brees Hall didn't look good. Then we're going to have some people arguing, oh, he's playing with a, a second offensive line. None of it matters, guys. None of it matters at all. Don't focus in on a single preseason game to determine how a running back looked and where you're going to draft them in fantasy football. Now, preseason does matter to look at usage, to figure out, oh, crap, um, Boston Scott now is going to be a running back touching the ball for Philadelphia. Oh, crap. Ronald Jones getting cut. Isaiah Pacheco is going to be the running back too in case. That stuff matters. But for you to go out there and just scout a running back off of eight touches in a single preseason, no, take a step back. Elite athlete at the NFL Combine. He has the team investment by the Jets in the second round. He was a workhorse running back in college. A great pass catcher. He has the size. He checks every box you look for. I'm fine. Taking Brees Hall. Don't worry about a preseason game. Now, let's drop it down to tier. Let's go over to a running back that I'm getting in the sixth round on underdog. David Montgomery. Guys, how far are you going to take this hate? How far are you going to take the David Montgomery hate here? Where we're looking at a running back that was the running back seven on a points per game basis two years ago. In a horrendous situation. Chicago has not been a good football team. Or at least they've not had a good offense in a very long time. I understand this offense is going to be very bad this upcoming season yet again. But Khalil Herbert should not be someone that you're concerned about in the slightest. If we look at the usage that he had when David Montgomery came back and was healthy. Even after Herbert broke out, he was still the clear backup running back in Chicago. David Montgomery, cheapest touches you're going to get at the position. And I don't even want to say he has a cap ceiling. I mean, sure, we can make the argument he has a cap ceiling because how bad the offense, offensive line is. How he's probably not going to be busting off a ton of big plays given the fact that defenses are going to be able to stack the box when the only wide receiver they have to worry about is Darnell Mooney. But he was in a very bad situation in 2020. And like we said, he was the running back seven, only behind elite level guys and James Robinson. <laughs> but going to our next running back, we're going to have A.J. Dillon here. Yes, we did move up A.J. Dillon two spots, moved him ahead of Josh Jacobs, moved him ahead of Elijah Mitchell. I feel like that we have to go ahead and do it based on the reports that we're getting out of Green Bay because if A.J. Dillon were to come in that red zone role in Green Bay, all of a sudden he would be a running back with startability on a week-to-week basis. I'm concerned that if he does not have the red zone role, even if he is getting, say, 12 carries a game in Green Bay, 13 carries a game, if he's not getting touches in the red zone, Does 12 carries for 65 rushing yards and one reception for eight receiving yards actually help you? Probably not. I mean, what? You're getting like seven, eight points. But if all of a sudden these reports are true and you are going to look at him as a running back that has that role in the red zone. And obviously, if Aaron Jones were to go down, A.J. Dillon could be a top three running back in fantasy. We got to give the man his respect. 
And now going down to 23, we are going to have Elijah Mitchell. Just so hard to figure out who the starting running back is going to be for Kyle Shanahan. If we look at the history since he came over to San Francisco, it's literally a different starting running back or different leading rusher every single season since 2017. It's no guarantee that Elijah Mitchell is going to be the leading rusher this upcoming season. In my opinion, he is by far and away the favorite for that. But even if he is the starting running back here, he should have a cap ceiling in that. We know Trey Lance isn't going to check the ball down. We know those rushing quarterbacks don't have to. And Lance is a big body quarterback. Maybe Lance is like Cam Newton, where he's just going to be vulturing all the rushing touchdowns at the goal line. Then our last running back we're going to have in this tier. I know everybody hates him. Josh Jacobs with Josh Jacobs here. Probably the most hated running back in fantasy. Like I'm drafting him in round seven on underdog consistently. Like he's literally my most drafted running back. We're getting him neck and neck with like Kadarius Tony. Like I, I'm taking Josh Jacobs here. Three straight seasons is a high end running back too. Yes, we need to be concerned that this team looks to throw the ball more specifically in the red zone now that they have Devontae Adams. We need to be concerned that maybe he doesn't have the same role that he did last year as a receiver where he averaged four targets a game because you have Devontae Adams there. You have hopefully a healthy Darren Waller. He doesn't have to have as high of a target share in this offense. But with them moving on from Kenyon Drake, yes, obviously it speaks well on Samir White. But at the same time, I think it does make Jacobs a little bit more exciting. Now, Let's go down to running back 25 next tier here. And let's start it off with Clyde Edwards Alaire. With CEH, we've had the bold call in our hot take running back episode. We said that he had the upside to be a top 12 running back in fantasy. I'm standing by it, guys. I understand. Yes, Isaiah Pacheco does look like he is going to be the second running back here, but Isaiah Pacheco is a seventh round rookie out of Rutgers who is never efficient, never efficient at Rutgers. I'm not a believer in Pacheco. Looks like Ronald Jones may not even make this roster by the time this video is out. Maybe Rojo's already cut. Clyde Rizalaire can catch passes. Clyde Rizalaire is going to be playing in a top five offense in the NFL. And there's the outside chance that the injuries actually did hinder him significantly last year. Obviously, he had gallbladder surgery, causing him to drop 15 pounds before the season started. Also, he dealt with a multitude of injuries during the year as well. If there's an outside chance that he's a better running back than we saw last season, which I'm not saying is guaranteed, trust me. Oh, I'm not, I'm not saying that's likely. But if there's the outside chance that what if he's a good NFL running back or an average NFL running back, he crushes in this offense. Even if he's a bad running back, if you're the starting running back at Kansas City, you're going to have a baseline level of overall points because we know this team is going to have extended drives. We know this team is going to have a significant amount of red zone opportunities. Now, running back 26 here is going to be Chase Edmonds. With Chase Edmonds at this point, I think that you are looking at him as probably the clear-cut starter in Miami. Even if he's not the clear-cut starter, even if he's split in the role with like a Raheem Moss, it doesn't really matter. Edmonds is the only running back in this backfield that knows how to catch a pass. He's the only running back that has a receiving down skill set. So it's a very high floor that you're going to find for the Miami Dolphins. This is an improved offensive line. It's still a very bad offensive line overall. But there is that outside chance that Edmonds is used as a three down player. And we've already highlighted that in previous videos where we've seen him very specific instances in Arizona where the team had to rely on him as that full time starter. And he handled 20 carries just fine. Now, our last running back in this tier is going to be Tony Pollard. Tony Pollard is someone that I've not been drafting a ton of. Like, I've seen Tony Pollard get drafted before Josh Jacobs in way too many drafts. A lot of people are very excited about the upside that Pollard has. Of course, in the instance of an Ezekiel Elliott injury, maybe Tony Pollard could be a top 10, top 5 running back in the NFL. And even if Ezekiel Elliott stays healthy, a lot of people have been speculating that Tony Pollard may finally be one of these running backs that is kind of used as a hybrid wide receiver because if you look at this depth chart for the beginning of the season with the Dallas Cowboys, no Michael Gallup, no Amari Cooper, no Cedric Wilson, and now no James Washington. Who else, who else can they get the ball to outside of maybe throwing Tony Pollard in the slot? I don't know. We'll see. Obviously, the elite level ceiling, if something were to occur to Ezekiel Elliott, unsure if you can actually go through and start him however if we don't have that Zeke injury now let's drop it down another tier let's lead it off with Kareem Hunt at 28 with Hunt running behind an elite offensive line still in a committee in Cleveland I think he's the perfect guy that I'm targeting after round 10 I mean you're getting Kareem Hunt at a significantly cheaper cost than you have guys like an AJ Dillon like a Tony Pollard I think all these players are going to be in a similar bucket where 
We don't know if you can start them outside of an injury to the running back in front of them. But if that injury were to occur, they have top 10 upside. And I, like I said earlier with Nick Chubb, am actually more excited about the Deshaun Watson offense here in Cleveland. Even if it means they run the ball less, they should be able to put up more points per drive. They should be able to have those extended drives and more plays overall to go around. Now, running back 29, we've had to drop him significantly. Miles Sanders. With Sanders, I'm not going to lie to you. I was completely fine going out there and paying up the price for him previously. He's a running back going at the 7-8 turn. I was like, oh, hell yeah. Give me some Clyde with a layer. Give me some Miles Sanders. Yeah, I'll, I'll be happy to go through and draft him. But the training camp injury, he should be good week one, but the training camp injury had an effect. Because if we're looking at how Boston Scott's been implemented into this offense, I think it is significantly less likely now that they decide to phase out 27-year-old Boston Scott, who I don't see as a special talent. Now, of course, Boston Scott's better at the game of football than I'll be at anything ever in my entire life. But still, maybe it's just a dream to be rooting for Miles Sanders and Kenneth Gainwell to just split this backfield and nobody else to get touches. As it does look like Scott's going to be involved, and that is going to severely handicap expectations for Miles Sanders. Then our last running back on this list is going to be everybody's favorite rookie, Damian Pierce, looking like by far and away the best running back in Houston. I'm not drafting Damian Pierce very often, though. Like, if you look at these rankings compared to where he's currently going in drafts, like if you follow these rankings, you're not going to be coming away with many Damian Pierce shares. My thought process is, hell, even if he is the starting running back in Houston, this is a running back that wasn't particularly athletic. This was a running back that was never a three-down player at Florida. This is a running back that fell to day three of the NFL draft. And if he overcomes all this, we put this down and we assume that Damian Pierce is an elite talent, which I don't think he is. I think he's okay running back. I don't think he's an elite talent, but he's probably a lot better than Marlon Mack. You have the starting running back for the Houston Texans. Vegas has this as the worst team in the NFL. They have a bottom five offensive line. And then are you really starting him, especially if you're playing in a shallow redraft format? Even if he does earn that starting role. What's your realistic expectation? Now, I think that's going to be it for this video. Please go down there to the comment section. Let me know what you think. Drop that like if you have not done so. If you have not dropped a like in this video, I don't know what to say. If you have not subscribed to this channel, I don't know what to say to you. We are trying to get to that 90,000 sub mark to get that 24-hour live stream going to have that draft marathon special. But I appreciate all of you. I hope you have a great day, and I hope we get to see you with the live stream tonight.